know, given that psilocybin, we now know, you know, in, in clinical studies produces these mystical unit of experiences and psilocybin is incredibly closely related to DMT structurally, right? Like I've had several people say that it's like uh, orally active DMT. It's, you know, it's um, just one hydroxy group different. And, um, but then as you say, the, these DMT experiences are anything but, but empty of content, right? They're incredibly uh, intense and rich, rich and spatial and things that a lot of things are happening. Um, would you be able to kind of sketch out some of the kind of maybe even like a prototypical DMT experience to someone who has no idea of this terrain or just some of the main themes? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, but, you know, first uh, I'd like to address your point about, you know, psilocybin inducing mystical experiences. Um, you know, the mystical unit of state. Uh, yeah, the two compounds are quite are are quite you know closely related. Uh, yeah, I um, mean, you know, so in a way, it's you know DMT with a hydroxy group is you know psilocin, you know, which is the active uh, you know metabolite um, of psilocybin. Um, you know, but uh, the frequency or the prevalence or the, you know the high incidence of the mystical unitive state in the current you know parlance especially emanating, you know, from the Hopkins, you know, research group um, is a, you know, function of the set and the setting. It isn't a property of the drug per se. You know, the drug itself is working on the person's mind, the person's, you know, psyche. And in those studies, uh, they do 10 to 12 hours of, you know, preparatory psychotherapy. It's also education, though. It's education, which, you know, teaches about the mystical experience and its utility and how wonderful it is. And if you attain a mystical experience, all kinds of good things will happen to you. And that's the goal of our work in the, in the drug state. So there's, you know, they're prepared, they're indoctrinated in a way, they're, um, you know, you know, trained, you know, to recognize and encourage the mystical experience. Um, and they're informed of its great you know, value and esteem. Uh, so in the drug state, you're instructed to react to the experience in a certain manner that will optimize the outcome that you're looking for, which is a mystical state. So, you know, so, you know for example, if you're in a you know, tight spot you know, during your psilocybin experience, there's a you know, couple of ways of you know, dealing with that. You, you, you know, one is to let be, let go. You know, uh, you um, approach it passively, which is encur which in encourages ego dissolution. Uh, you know, kind of you know lack of volition. You know, but you could also respond to being in a tight space through prayer. You could pray for help to God or to you know the equivalent. In which case. The experience may be entirely, you know, differently because you're reacting to the drug experience in a you know totally you know different way, and you know we all know that our you know drug experiences are dependent on our res responses to them, you know. So if you you know treat one you know, set of experiences you know passively, and you treat the you know same uh, you know set of experiences you know more actively. Uh, the experience may be completely different. If 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 you're you know praying uh, in your you know kind of you know tight corner there, uh, you might be answered. In which case you'd begin interacting with the content of the state. If you just let go, let be, you're just kind of expanding into some you know nameless you know formless thing. Uh, it isn't an interaction. You're, you know, giving up volition. You're, you're giving up your personality. Uh, you know, so that's, you know, the acute, you know, drug state is, you know, set up to have a mystical experience. And then, you know, finally, integration. Integration is perceived through this, uh, you know, theological psychology that's, a, you know, you know mishmash of Vedanta, New Age, uh, you know, Christianity uh, about, you know, all is one, uh, you know, things are, you know, relative, you know, it's, you know, more of the let be, let go. 
uh, but it could have a completely different way of interpreting it. You know, like, okay, you encountered this thing in your, in, in your drug experience yesterday and you interacted and it interacted with you and you with it. You know, what did it say? And what do you get out of that? And you know, how do you understand that? And you know, how will you, you know, develop the ideas that came to you in that drug state in the future? You know, so that's a completely different, you know, way of integrating and interpreting the drug state as well. You know, so, you know, to think that, you know, drugs, you know, possess inherent uh, effects, you know, psychedelics are not inherently spiritual, and they you know, certainly aren't, in, uh, you know, mystical, I'm um, inherently, you know, they're just drugs. And, you, you know, they're working on your mind, you know, so they, uh, you wouldn't you know, be having that kind of experience if it weren't, uh, you know, uh, your personality, for your background, for all of the, you know, 12 hours of education that you've gotten about what to anticipate. Um, you know, so, you know, they're inherently, you know, neither good nor bad, mystical or prophetic, uh, useful or not. Uh, it's all depending on, uh, you, know, you know, who you are, your intention, you know, the intention of, you know, those around you. Yeah, you know, so that's, you know, my long-winded, uh, you know, diatribe against, uh, you know, kind of, you know, pigeonholing these, you know, yeah. drugs as you know, possessing specific effects that are, uh, in, you know, that are, you know, um, um, you know, that are in variant, uh, right. you know, they're just drugs. I'm really glad you made that point because, uh, yeah, as you say, the trip isn't in the drug, right? The drug's just a physical thing. And I think you're really right that the, you know, with psilocybin is this slow release thing, which gives you the opportunity to go in the direction of surrendering and dissolving into everything, or you can also go in the direction of engaging in this interactive way, as you say, and it's known that, you know, at very high doses, a psilocybin trip can be very much like a DMT experience, very interactive. And, and on the other hand, you know, if you slow down the DMT experience with ayahuasca, people ha seem to have more of these unitive experiences. So I think that's really um, useful to think about this psychological landscape that you've kind of laid out. Um, and it, it makes sense as well that with, you know, the kinetics of, um, you know, vaporized and inhaled DMT as people widely use it or uh, intravenously injected as you did in your study. You know, we're talking about 10 minutes, 20 minutes, maybe of an experience that comes over you very fast in a situation where I think it's probably hard to surrender. So while there may be the potential for a unitive kind of surrendering approach, I think that almost the kinetics of it, the dynamics makes it quite hard to um, probably pushes it in the direction of interaction. Um, well, yeah, I, I agree. Um, yeah, you know, uh, but I think it's, you know, more of, uh, you know, what you want to get out of it. Uh, you know, w w you can, you can dissolve into the DMT state. I mean, our one volunteer did, but it's more difficult, you know, phenomenologically, uh, you, know, uh, you know, because, you know, the phenomenology of the DMT state, you know, which we will uh, discuss uh, is, you know, quite colorful, you know, quite interactive. It's, you know, full of stuff. 5-methoxy-DMT, it's, you know, pharmacology or it's, you know, phenomenology is slightly different. You know, I mean, it is, you know, more, you know, prone to giving you the white light experience. You know, but even that isn't invariant. You know, the first time I smoked, you know, 5-methoxy-DMT, it was my first encounter with the beings. I mean, the place was loaded. Uh, with these, you know, little dwarves, um, you know, so that was, you know, 5-methoxy-DMT and the, you know, the other people in the room smoked it and it was, you know, the white light kind of thing, uh, you know, so I think certain, you know, drugs, you know, lend themselves to certain, you know, phenomenology, but, you know, what you do with that phenomenology depends on you, you know, so you could be in the white light and you can start to pray, you wouldn't have to just, you know, hang out in the white light. Um, and, you know, from, you know, the biblical you know, perspective, you know, the white light would be what you would call God's glory. It isn't God, you know, you can't really perceive God. I mean, you know, God's imperceptible, you know, but you could see, uh, you know, reflections of God or God's backside as it were, 
And you know, one of those uh, manifestations is, is called glory, kavod, uh, which also means uh, you know, serious or heavy or weighty. It, it can also mean liver, you know, like your liver. Uh, you know, so that's an interesting etymology. You know, but uh, you know, kavod, you know, kavod is God's glory, and it's the white light. I, you know, in a lot of ways, and you can interact with kavod. I mean, you can interact with God's glory. You could ask it questions. You could pray. You could, uh, you know, glorify it. Uh, you can argue with it. Uh, you can ask for help you know, from it. Uh, you know, so even in the white light case, you don't, you know, necessarily, you know, need to dissolve into it. You can. Uh, you know, parse it out um, a little more interactively.